everybody, and welcome to another beautiful Thursday. You're listening to Bhavani at I Eat Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I have a great show for you all today. My guest will be Stephen McFadden. He's joining me to talk about his book, Deep Agroecology. And I'm sure for many of you, you're wondering what is agroecology, and we will get to that in just a little bit when he comes on. But first, I want to talk to you about things going on in and around the news, um, ways that you can take action, and also tell you about my Zoom cooking classes that are really gaining momentum and I'm having so much fun with. Why don't I start with those? My Zoom cooking classes are every Wednesday evening at 5 p.m., and it is actually not just a class, but it's a cook, cook-along um, if you sign up ahead of time, I send you the recipe, and you can try to have as many of the ingredients as possible. During this pandemic, I know that's not always possible, but I can always make suggestions for substitutes. But anyway, you come prepared to cook along with me, and we start at 5, and by 6 o'clock, you're sitting down to a really delicious dinner for you and your family. So um, I hope you can join us. I want to share with you what we made last night, which is a ziti siciliano, and I'll be sharing that with you in just a bit. It was really delicious, and we had so much fun making it. And so what I'm going to do is, you know, every Thursday I'll share the recipe that we did the night before. So um, I want to talk to you about some things going on in the news and some things going on in my life. I've been helping out at the Glen Cove Food Pantry, which is a food pantry that started up a little bit before we actually closed down the school because so many of our students come from um, come from families that are really struggling and the food it became obvious that we needed to start a food pantry to service them and then when the pandemic hit and school closed it really became essential the cafeteria ladies that I work with they're continuing to make breakfast and lunch for the kids every day so every day when Um, they can come by and pick up a bagged lunch with the next morning's breakfast in it. Um, But in addition, every Wednesday, uh, we have been having curbside pickup of a week's worth of groceries. And for those families that can't drive, we've actually even been delivering. And a few weeks ago, I partnered with an organization called Italians Feed America, and I drove to Jersey City and picked up hundreds of pounds of pasta and tomato sauce, And then they actually came out and um, donated pizzas, 150 pizzas. And this week, they brought brought Pantanone cakes and chocolate Easter eggs. And it was just really, they were so beautifully packaged and everybody felt like it was a holiday. So that was really wonderful. Um, They are a nonprofit organization. So if you look up Italians Feed America, they appreciate any type of donations. Um, and let's see, um, I will be making next week's Zoom class, we'll be making a uh, miso vegetable chowder. So again, if you sign up, I will send you that recipe. And miso soup is one of those things that it's just my go-to anytime I'm feeling run down or anything like that. So, um, so sign in and you can join us for that. So also, um, ways that you can take action. I always like to get my listeners involved in becoming active citizens to make our world a better place. And the Williams Pipeline I've been fighting against for, I can't remember how many years, but this is a pipeline that's going to go from Pennsylvania through New Jersey into Staten Island, across New York Harbor, into the Rockaways and Long Island. And it is just bad, bad news. First off, we know that pipelines leak. Um, Most of them do. And if that leaks, not only will it wreck the marine life, it will do such damage to the um, to the industry, the you know the entertainment industry and the um, beaches and you know all the commerce that happens around beaches. Although who knows what will be happening this summer. but the wildlife and just everybody's health. I mean, if, you know, if we have a disaster like that. Um, also, pipelines are 
targets for terrorism and, you know, so close to New York City, that's really something we want to avoid. So please, um, on my website, there's a, um, a phone number where you can call Governor Cuomo. He has, he has denied the, this permit already a couple times, and they keep coming back and reapplying and reapplying, trying to tweak it to make it passable. But we need to let the governor know that we are behind him in denying it once and for all. So please, please sign that. We also want to... Um, want to get in touch with our attorney general. Um, right now there's a lawsuit to, um, to file a suit against the Trump administration for not enforcing our national environmental laws during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is something that's just unbelievable to believe, but it's true. Because of the pandemic, they're saying that they don't have enough people to enforce these um, regulations, and they're giving basically a green light to polluters to pollute our water and our soil, and we just need to really step up and let our voices be heard. So there's links on my website under Take Action where you can really um, let your voice be heard, and I really, really beg you to do that. Also, I want to let you all know, if you know any families in need of food, in addition to the Glencoe Food Pantry, there's so many different um, food pantries that are really stepping up. But one organization that I really want to shed a light on is called Community Solidarity. They are the largest vegan um, food rescue organization in the country. And they rescue food that otherwise would find its way into the waste stream, into landfills, they recover that, and it's perfectly good food, but sometimes, you know, supermarkets just get too much, and so they, you know, have to get rid of some in order to make room for the new shipments, and the food is really beautiful, and they get hundreds of thousands of pounds a week that they share. Um, they're feeding over 10,000 families a week. They're unbelievable. Uh, they've gone to curbside pickup as well, so you can just pull up and open the trunk of your car, and they'll put in a box worth of fresh produce for a full week. And they have so many volunteers um, on board helping out. So, you know, if you know anybody hungry or if you want to donate to Community Solidarity or you want to volunteer, you can find them on Facebook. You can find their website. Um, there's a great article that I linked from Newsday. They've really been getting some great deserved recognition. So um, support Community Solidarity. And I also wanted to encourage you all, if you have not joined a CSA, unfortunately many CSAs are already sold out, but you still might be able to find one. If you go to localharvest.org, they have a whole list of, you can plug in where you live and they'll tell you the CSAs in your area. They'll also show you where farmer's markets are and farm stands. And, um, you know, we have a few organic farmer's markets here on Long Island, a lot of farmers markets, you should know that they're not all organic. So you really need to talk to the farmer unless you know that your farmers market is all organic and the Port Washington farmers market is organic and the Seacliff farmers market is organic. But otherwise, you really need to check with the farmer and find out if they're organic. And when I say organic, I don't really mean whether or not they have that piece of paper and are certified. I mean, are they following organic Standards. Are they taking care of the earth the way they're supposed to? Are they not spraying with herbicides and pesticides? Are they not using genetically modified seeds? Those are all the questions you want to ask. And um, if they're doing all the right things, but they just don't have that certification because they can't afford to file for it, that's okay with me and should be okay with you. So anyway, just support your local farmers. They really um, you know, are so essential to our food system. And this pandemic is really shedding a light on how broken our food system is. And I'm sure we'll get into talking about that with my guest when he comes on in just a little bit. First, before he does, I want to share with you my weekly recipe. Um, what we made last night was a VDC, uh, ve vegan ziti siciliano with a cashew ricotta cheese. And there's three different components to this recipe. First, we're going to be making a cashew ricotta filling. Then we're also going to fry up the eggplant. And then we're going to make the sauce. And then we'll bring it all together. So for the cashew ricotta, these are the ingredients you need. Three cups of cashews, 
that you need to soak for two hours prior to start starting your recipe, three cups of filtered water, two tablespoons nutritional yeast, and that's good tasting nutritional yeast, which I use a lot in my cooking. Um, in a lot of vegan recipes, it gives a little bit of a cheesy flavor to things. It's really wonderful. So um, if you don't know of nutritional yeast, I look forward to introducing that to you. A quarter teaspoon of minced garlic and a half a teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. And that is what you need for the ricotta filling. Then for frying up the eggplant, first thing we're going to do is be making a vegan egg. And for that, I use two tablespoons of ground flax seeds that I mix with two tablespoons of water. And you just let that sit for a while and it becomes glutinous, kind of like an egg would. Then you need a quarter cup of a milk alternative, whether oat milk, soy milk, rice milk, whatever you have. A cup of breadcrumbs, and if you want this to be gluten-free, you can use gluten-free breadcrumbs. A tablespoon of nutritional yeast, a tablespoon of dried oregano, a tablespoon of dried basil, a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder, a quarter teaspoon of salt, an eighth of teaspoon of black pepper, and then olive oil. And you can either fry this part or you can bake it in the oven. I'll tell you about that when we get to the actual recipe. Then for the sauce... I start with a jar of my favorite marinara sauce, and you can use whatever marinara sauce you like. Um, Just look at the ingredients, because if you are vegan, many marinara sauces will put Parmesan cheese in it, which obviously if you're not eating dairy, you don't want. So just look at the ingredients. Make sure that they're all good. Um, I recommend organic if possible, because tomatoes are on that dirty dozen list, so you really want to Try to eat organic tomatoes. Two tablespoons minced garlic, one teaspoon dried oregano, and one teaspoon dried basil. Of course, you can use fresh if you have it. One 28-ounce can of diced fire-roasted tomatoes, one onion, one yellow or orange organic pepper, a half a cup of white wine, olive oil for sautéing, and a quarter cup of chopped parsley. And then for the pasta, you're going to use whatever you like, whether it's... um, uh, box of whole wheat penne or organic white penne or brown rice penne or a quinoa pasta if you're going gluten-free, whatever you like, um, but one pound's worth. Uh, you could also use, if, you, if one of your boxes is 12 ounces, that's enough as well. You can do that. A quarter cup of chopped parsley that you're going to use for garnish and one package, which is a half a pound of the Mayoka cashew mozzarella cheese. Mayoko um, has a great vegan cheese cookbook, and her mozzarella cheese is the best one out there, in my opinion. So that's the one I recommend. So for the recipe, we're going to start by getting the sauce going. So in a hot, heavy saucepan, you're going to put a little olive oil in the bottom of uh, the pan or the pot. And when it's hot, add your onions, and you're going to saute the onions until they're soft and translucent. Then add the peppers and saute that for about another five minutes. You add the half a cup of white wine and let that cook down for a few minutes. Then you're going to add the marinara sauce, the can of diced tomatoes, the oregano, the basil, the cup of chopped parsley, and let that cook. And just let that simmer down while we do everything else. So for the cashew ricotta cheese, actually you might want to put on a pot of uh, water to boil for the pasta. And the pasta you're just going to cook according to the directions. Um, and make it al dente. You don't want to overcook it because, remember, it's going to bake in the oven as well. For the cashew ricotta cheese, you're going to drain the cashews, then put them into a food processor. With um, Start with two and a half cups of water. Um, You can go up to three cups if you want, but two and a half cups of water, and pulse that for a while. Um, Add the nutritional yeast, the garlic, the salt and pepper, and keep pulsing until it's smooth. And this needs to get really, really smooth. So you're going to have to scrape down the sides and keep pulsing it and then just let it run for a while. Um, You can taste it. And if if you taste little gritty pieces of the nuts, it's not whipped up enough. You really want it to be fully smooth. So just keep um, letting that go. Um, For the eggplant... You're going to cut off the ends of the eggplant, and I partially peel it. I kind of like make it into stripes every other peel. Um, And then you're going to cut the eggplant into one quarter inch thick slices. You're going to pull out two pie plates, and in one pie plate, you're going to make the egg mixture with the flaxseed in the water, and then you're going to add the milk to that. 
And then in the other pie pan, you can combine the breadcrumbs, the nutritional yeast, and all of the spices, along with the salt and pepper. And then just like you are breading anything, you're going to dip it into the vegan egg mixture and then into the breadcrumbs. And then it's going to go either into a frying pan that you have some hot olive oil in, or you can bake it on a cookie sheet. And if you're going to bake it on a cookie sheet, which is actually what I recommend because it uses so much less oil, um, you can line the cookie sheet with some parchment paper, then brush some olive oil or spray some olive oil on it. You want a little olive oil so that the um, breadcrumbs actually get crispy. But then just lay the eggplant right onto the cookie sheet and bake that in a 350 or 375 degree oven for 10 minutes until one side gets golden brown, then turn it over and let it cook another five minutes till the other side gets golden brown. If you prefer to fry it in a frying pan, you're just going to, you know, put in the oil and fry up one side till it gets golden brown and then the other side. You don't want to fry it too hot because um, you really want the eggplant to have time to cook all the way through. So on a medium heat, you're going to be frying this up and then you're going to drain it on a paper towel to absorb the oil. Then, um, of course, you've cooked the pasta and you drain the pasta. Now we're going to assemble the ziti. And so you're going to remove two cups of the marinara sauce from the pot first. Um, you're going to cover the bottom of a lasagna pan or a casserole pan with one cup of the tomato sauce. Um, then you're going to, once you've, now that you've removed two cups of the tomato sauce from the pot, you can add all of the ziti into the pot and mix that up so that the ziti is covered with the tomato sauce. Take half of that penne or ziti out and put it into the casserole pan. Add one half of the, um, actually put the fried eggplants on top of that. Cover it with one half of the ricotta cheese mixture, the cashew ricotta cheese. Add more pasta, the rest of the pasta to the top. Then layer it with the remaining ricotta cheese. And then you're going to top that off with the cup of remaining marinara sauce. And you're going to cover it with foil and bake it for about 20 minutes. And the ricotta, the cashew ricotta cheese, which is relatively thin, it's almost like a bechamel sauce, will thicken up as it cooks. And it becomes just really, just holds it all together, and it's really delicious. And then after 20 minutes, pull the um, casserole out of the oven, sprinkle the shredded mozzarella cheese on top, and put it back in the oven for another 10 minutes of the mozzarella cheese um, melts. And that's it. You're going to garnish it with the fresh chopped parsley. And it's delicious. I actually, um, you know, saved it and had it on Mother's Day. It was so great. So enjoy that. And um, now it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you my guest this week, Stephen McFadden. He's the author of the book Deep Agroecology. And Stephen is an independent journalist, and he's been writing about the earth, farms, and food for decades. And his latest book, Deep Agroecology, Farms, Food, and Our Future, is an expression of practical, purposeful, and realistic hope. It's a global vision to build the type of food system that we all need. And Stephen was one of the first people to really write about community-supported agriculture in his book, Farms of Tomorrow, Community-Supported Farms, Farms Supported Communities, and he wrote that along with Traga Grow, and um, then they rewrote it or updated it and called it Farms of Tomorrow Revisited, and um, he also wrote the book The Call of the Land, an agrarian primer for the 21st century, and Awakening Community Intelligence, CSA Farms as 21st Century Cornerstones, and all of his books are really great, but one of the things that I really just discovered that I love so much was um, his online book called Odyssey of the Eighth Fire, which is a doc- which is his documented journey um, that he did. It was a spiritual journey across America, starting in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and walking all the way to California with dozens of stops along the way with traditional learned elders of North America. And, you know, he has a lot of messages that they shared with him that he shares in this 
um, Odyssey of the Eighth Fire, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful journey. And um, he'll tell us more about that, too. So it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Stephen McFadden. Stephen, you with me? Yes, I am. Thanks for inviting me on your show, Bhavani. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. And I thought maybe we should start with telling everyone what agroecology is. Um, it sounds yes. like an academic or abstract concept, but it's, you know, why should people really know about it? Well, it's a term that's used around the world quite a bit. It uh, hasn't really established itself in uh, America, but I think it will over time. It's the way that uh, people in other countries talk about sustainable, renewable, regenerative agriculture, whether it's organics or biodynamics and uh, lots of other possibilities. And uh, It's also a, a social movement uh, recognizing that People at all levels of the food system are essential for all of us. I think we see that now, uh, especially in our uh, supermarkets where uh, the clerks and uh, the stocking people all have to wear masks and uh, you know, we plunge in for a few minutes to do our shopping, but they're there all day taking care of us and our needs. And so we begin to appreciate uh, more profoundly how important they are in our lives. And likewise for all of the farm workers um, who are out there uh, in the fields growing the food. Uh huh. Um, yeah, well, your book is just um, really a beautiful, um, beautiful book. You know, one of the things that, one of the quotes that I highlighted was. Um, you know, something that one of the elders said, the commodification of nature, land, water, and air casts everything in a different light, a light that is not healthy and cannot sustain over generations. And you, you know, do a lot of, you know, with the Odyssey of the Eighth Fire, and in this book you really connect a lot with the Native American elders and their wisdom. Um, do you, can you share with my listeners what your connection to um, Native American people are? Well, it goes back to the simplest thing, Bhavani. You know, uh, it was a bumper sticker uh, that woke me up. You know, so you might tend to discount something like that, but often it's the, the smallest things that can make a difference. Uh, I guess it was back in the 1970s I saw a, a bumper sticker uh, in the little town where I was living in New Hampshire, and it said, Broken Treaty Score, uh, Red Man Zero, uh, White Man uh, 375 or something like that. I don't remember the exact number. And I couldn't figure out what it was talking about. So when the owner of the vehicle came out, I asked, and he said, there have been, you know, these 370-some-odd uh, legally binding treaties that the United States government has entered into uh, with various Native nations. Every one of them has been broken or violated. Well, I didn't believe that. Uh, it just seemed inconceivable to me that we could have broken every one. Uh, you know, maybe if we'd broken 25% or 30%, you'd, you'd shrug your shoulders and say, well, you know, that's life. But 100%, uh, so I investigated and uh, learned that it was true. We have broken or violated every agreement, and uh, that didn't sit well with me. Uh, it, I feel very much uh, an American, and I feel very much as though the government in its actions represents me, uh, and I have a responsibility to make sure that it acts with honor. Uh, so one thing led to another, and I began investigating and uh, wound up learning a great deal. And then, as you mentioned earlier, Bhavani, I was part of that long walk that went from First Encounter Beach on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, to the Western Gateway at Point Conception, and so eight months of walking and listening and learning uh, from different elders, uh, it really uh, deepened my relationship uh, to the people of the Americas as well as uh, the land itself. Yeah. You know, it breaks my heart also, you know, as I read the paper, you know, this pandemic is really hitting the Native American um, reservations really, really harshly. Um, yes, it is. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and how um, our food is being impacted by this pandemic? 
Mm-hmm. Well, I'm uh, not better informed on what's going on uh, with the coronavirus in the Native community than uh, what we see in the newspaper. Uh, now I'm living in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, I am pretty far away from all of that. Uh, I feel uh, great sorrow uh, for what's going on uh, all over. It is, of course, the coronavirus also impacting uh, our food supply chain, not just in the packing houses, but also out in the fields, uh, as most people are probably aware. People coming up from uh, South America and Central America uh, do the bulk of work uh, in the fields with the planting and the picking, uh, and they have been uh, rebuffed and turned away uh, at the entrance and scorned uh, largely by the current administration in the White House. So there's a, a, a labor shortage uh, that is beginning to play out uh, throughout the food chain. And, of course, we read about it in the, in the packing houses all the time uh, where uh, the beef and the chicken and all the rest of it are processed uh, for our supermarkets and so that problem is just continuing to build, uh, and uh, anything that any one of us can do to uh, staunch the spread of the pandemic is so important. And that comes down to the simple things of washing our hands, wearing masks, and uh, keeping a, a good distance from other people. Sure. Um, yeah, I've also you know been reading about how the large the large farms, you know, the industrial agricultural system are the ones that really can't readjust and adapt to what's going on. I mean, they are so dependent on um, the way the food chain has been set up so that they, you know, go to big distributors and they go to, then they go to restaurants and, you know, they just can't retool and, um, you know, on a short notice and adjust. You know, you hear about all the gallons of milk that are being dumped and things like that because places that, you know, make small little containers for school lunches, they can't all of a sudden start packaging into gallon containers because they don't have that toolage. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just really interesting when you start seeing our food chain and how um, inflexible it is for a pandemic like this. It actually seems like the smaller farms are able to weather this storm a little bit better than some of the bigger farms. Um, Yeah, it's true what you suggest. I mean, we are living in a moment of tremendous historic importance, and the way that we're responding to the challenges now uh, is going to play a big part in shaping our future. I think it's helpful to keep that in mind, uh, that we are living in this moment of historical importance uh, and so even though, you know, we have to struggle with uh, the difficulties that each one of us faces each day, if we keep our focus on that historical situation and where we're headed, uh, we can make a tremendous difference. And it really is important, in my view, to uh, restructure the food system now, which has this uh, kind of oppressive hierarchy, uh, and we're all... Uh, resting on the labor uh, of the people at the bottom of the pyramid who are working for pennies uh, in difficult conditions and often with industrial agriculture in an environment saturated with chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, preservatives, and all the rest of it. Um, Every dollar that we spend at the food store Uh, is a vote that we're casting for the kind of food system that exists and the kind of food system that we want to buy. So bearing in mind that at the historic moment, uh, you know, vote for uh, a food system that is clean uh, and just and uh, socially responsible in all ways. Uh, That's the possibility that we have. And what In writing about deep agroecology, uh, that's what I was striving to uh, do, was to illuminate the vision that is held by millions of people around the world. And uh, we know them at our local food co-op. We know them at our CSA farms. We know them at the beautiful uh, restaurants and bakeries that are focused on 
uh, organic or biodynamic foods. And, uh, of course, it's a global phenomenon, and we need not just millions more people to get serious and to take up these practices, uh, but possibly billions. What do they say? There's 7.8 billion of us now, and uh, just a very few uh, are the food producers. So uh, either producing food or directly supporting those who produce it uh, in a way that's environmentally and socially and culturally uh, right for our times uh, is is the way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was talking about the farmer's markets before, you know, I think a lot of people don't even realize it. They just think, if, if I'm going to farmer's market, well, then it has to be organic. And that that's not necessarily the case either, that they really need to, you know, still ask the same questions because so many... Um, not just farmers, but big corporations do so much greenwashing to, you know, make something look, you know, they use organic as a marketing tool as opposed to really honoring why it's so important. You're, you're spot on with that, Bhavani. And I would say also, you know, if you're at a market and, and you don't see the organic possibilities, you can always speak to the farmer uh, not to uh, berate them or belittle them, but to encourage them and let them know that you as a consumer uh, want food that's grown without harmful chemicals. And uh, likewise, in your supermarket, if they don't stock uh, organic foods, you, know, you can speak to the manager. Uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, so if you let them know what you want, uh, the chances of it changing uh, so that things are better off, is greatly improved. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, you know, you talk about agroecology, but you actually emphasize deep. What is, what is the difference between deep agroecology um, or mm -hmm. deep ecology, for instance? Well, it is a basically a recognition that the, we exist in a, a unified field, that all things are related uh, Whatever we do something, it has a, a far-reaching impact. So deep agroecology takes into account uh, that there are realms of subtle energy and that they have an influence uh, on farms, food, and people. Uh, on a gross level, of course, you know, if you eat uh, a lot of uh, junk food, uh, you're going to deteriorate your own health. Now, what was the film... Uh, a few years ago where the man uh, ate at McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for over a month. Like his oh, name right. Was uh -huh. and, and you could see in the film uh, the changes on, on the outer level, the outer physical level, but he also talked about what was going on for him emotionally and in terms of his mental state. Much more difficult to have clear thinking and to wake up in the morning feeling uh, positive energy and ready to engage with the, the challenges and the pleasures of the day. Uh, so uh, eating a lot of crappy food uh, leads to a crappy state of well-being and I think shortens your life. And there are, of course, dozens and dozens of studies that uh, amplify this and give scientific evidence. On the other hand, uh, when we do eat a clean diet, we're not only improving our own physical and mental health, uh, but it goes on to the land uh, and to the farmers who are on the land because there's tremendous problems with pollution uh, in our streams and our soil and the killing off of uh, the microscopic life in the soil by the routine application of chemicals. So you improve the quality of the land and its capacity to uh, absorb CO2, that helps to stabilize the climate. Uh, you know, of course, it's, things are quite radical now in terms of climate disruption. And uh, I was just reading uh, a story in the New York Times, a, a column by David Brooks, uh, about we need national service now. Uh, and he's hearkening back to the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, that, President Roosevelt put in uh, back during the Depression, not only to give men and women uh, paid work, 
but also to take care of a great number of national needs. So he's talking about it in terms of uh, we need people to, you know, be out there doing testing and uh, contact tracing people who may have come in contact uh, with coronavirus. But I think we could also uh, put, you know, millions, I mean, what is there, 21 million people unemployed now, uh, put them to work uh, tending the land uh, and planting uh, organically on just about every plot of land to give them something positive to do to enrich the soil, to sequester CO2, uh, and, uh, of course, providing a, a, an honestly earned paycheck for themselves. Uh, you know, when people don't have anything to do, uh, great troubles begin to come. Uh, people need to have a purpose. And what better purpose than helping to uh, save the planet and stabilize the climate and create a healthier planet all the way around? Absolutely. But unfortunately, that takes some leadership, which we are, we are really lacking these days. Some good leadership, you know, that cares about the earth and that finds these things that we're talking about important, and that's just not happening. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And if you're just joining us, my guest this week is Stephen McFadden. He's the author of Deep Agroecology, Farms, Food, and Our Future. And we're talking about our food system and how um, David Brooks just wrote an article about Civilian Conservation Corps and how we can put everybody to work doing some good, taking care of the soil and the land, and yet, I was just saying, we don't have that kind of leadership. So um, let's talk a little bit about how social justice plays into agroecology. Um, you know, social justice and our food system is so interrelated. Maybe you could shed a little light on that for us. Sure. Well, uh, right now, of course, land is treated as a commodity, and uh, people who have Money can uh, not only claim that commodity, the land, uh, but then claim the fruits thereof. Uh, whereas people who are born into poor circumstances uh, don't really have any uh, direct claim and so can get cut out. And so we have, as is well known, a tremendous income disparity now where there's a very small percentage of people at the top of the pyramid who have vast wealth beyond imagination, almost uh, the billionaire class. And then this uh, vast class underneath who are struggling to get by and who uh, go from paycheck to paycheck and right now uh, don't even have a paycheck. So what what are people for? Uh, are this is, of course, a famous question posed by Wendell Berry. Uh, are they just to exist and wait for handouts? Um, I personally think we ought not to sit around waiting for the government uh, or, or a new government, if one should come along uh, after the election, uh, to solve the problem, but rather uh, to take the initiative ourselves and ask what can we do and uh, we see this year that there's an explosion of home gardens uh, or even people growing in pots on their balconies if they don't have uh, a yard. Uh, and that's all wonderful. Uh, but I think, as you were suggested at the top of the show, uh, participating in a CSA uh, is a way that you can not only enhance food security uh, but also enhance uh, social justice uh, because the CSA form uh, puts people in direct relationship with the farmer and you see the circumstances that they are living in and have an opportunity to interact uh, and give them the respect that is their due, uh, likewise at co-ops. So uh, I'm a, a big supporter uh, of people becoming directly involved, finding some way to connect with the food services whether it's through uh, joining a local co-op, starting a local co-op, uh, joining a CSA, or if you don't have one, uh, starting one. And, and here I want to uh, put in a plug for churches, temples, and synagogues because they already uh, are working social units. Uh, people come together once a week or whatever to 
shared their beliefs and, and their worship, they could also uh, begin to come together and cooperate uh, around food production and food security and give work to some of the younger people in their congregations. So I think that uh, all of the uh, religious institutions that are out there uh, need to become directly involved in this uh, by uh, promoting basically community-supported agriculture, or I suppose you could call it church or synagogue or temple-supported or mosque-supported agriculture. Uh, And that way the existing functioning social unit of the church community uh, puts itself to uh, real practical good. Yeah. You know, also uh, on Long Island, there's um, the uh, Long Island Community Agricultural Network, which has built a lot of community gardens on land of churches and synagogues. Um, I don't know if there was a mosque around or not, but I know churches and synagogues for sure, and built gardens because they had a built-in volunteer stream that could help the community gardens and then everything that they were growing they were donating to local food pantries you know i wonder wonder, i really don't know during the pandemic how that's been going whether they've been planting whether you know there's someone that's there to orchestrate the volunteers and coordinate them so i'm not sure how that's going right now but i know it was really a great um addition to the food pantries because it was offering the fresh produce which most of the food pantries are not getting, you know? Yes, and that makes such an uh, important difference in our health uh, over the long term. Uh, eating processed foods, as of course you well know, uh, leads to difficulties, health difficulties, not immediately, uh, but as the years go by, uh, the consequences build up. We're eating fresh, healthy food uh, gives you the vitality, the health, and the clarity of mind that are so important. Yeah. So in your book, you also um, present a lot of information about biodynamics um, as offering, um, you know, an example of deep agroecology. Can you talk about biodynamics? What's the difference between biodynamic and organic? Mm-hmm. Well, biodynamics actually preceded uh, organics, uh, and it was a system uh, that came out of the work of uh, an Austrian uh, philosopher named Rudolf Steiner, uh, who was clairvoyant uh, and could see into the spirit world, and he gave a series of agricultural lectures, um, I think actually back in the 1920s, and a number of farmers uh, who heard his messages took up his methods to create a holistic, ecological, and ethical approach to farming, and gardening, uh, food, and nutrition. And the movement uh, has developed over the years uh, to become global. And what biodynamics does is to also take into consideration the subtle energies uh, that are at work. And here I'm talking about the phases of the moon as well as the seasons and uh, the different ways that plants grow uh, in relationship with each other. And it's a little too esoteric for a lot of people uh, because they use what are essentially homeopathic preparations made from substances to promote uh, the health and well-being of the plants. And uh, people who are wedded to a strict scientific view uh, have been critical of this and saying, oh, well, like homeopathy itself, it it just doesn't work. Well, I often think to myself, it's difficult to uh, apply a strictly rational or intellectual uh, system of uh, evaluation to something that's more intuitive and flowing, which is to say uh, half of our lives is rational and the other half is irrational. Uh, And that's not to put down irrational. It's our feelings, which can be feelings of uh, ecstasy, of beauty, of joy, of love, uh, as well as all the other emotions that we're capable of. And so it's important to uh, honor uh, not only the rational, but also the irrational, and to hold them in right balance. Biodynamics does that, 
and out of the uh, early movement uh, came the organic movement. So biodynamics is all of the organic practices that we're familiar with, uh, plus uh, ways of working with subtle energy fields in order to enhance crop production. Here I have to say, uh, Bhavani, you know, I've uh, been a gardener uh, all my life, and I have visited dozens and dozens of farms. And to me, you know, you can have the debate with all the ideas, but the proof comes in actually uh, walking on the land and seeing the character uh, of the animals and the vegetables and the flowers that grow on a biodynamic farm. Uh, and, and that's what swung me over to the biodynamics uh, years ago, uh, was seeing on the land the difference that it makes. So the, the proof is in the pudding, uh, the proof is in the harvest. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know, I actually trained as a Waldorf educator and, um, you know, ran the cafeteria at our local Waldorf school and actually took a lot of Rudolf Steiner's teachings into the cafeteria, um, you know, with different days with, you know, he connects different, I don't even remember what they all are right now, but different days of the week were different grains, um, different colors, you know, we had a different color that we wore every day. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, and depending on um, a child's attributes, which, which, what you wanted to strengthen, whether you ate the root of the vegetable or the leaf of the vegetable, you know, they all had different um, characteristics that they enhanced. And mm-hmm. it was fascinating to study it. Fascinating. I really loved it. Yeah, it can become complicated, and uh, not everyone who goes into biodynamics goes into the, the whole of it. Uh, you know, uh, some uh, adapt the system uh, to their own you know, particularities. Of course, of course. So um, I wanted to go back to what I started with when I was talking about your um, spiritual journey, Odyssey, um, because you you interviewed a lot of Native American elders for this book, and I am fascinated with um, the wisdom that so many Native American elders hold, and I just thought maybe you could share with us some of the teachings that they shared with you and asked you to share with us. Well, the first one that comes to mind, Bhavani, uh, was something you referred to uh, earlier in the in the broadcast uh, about looking down the road to the other generations. Uh, there is pretty much uh, universally throughout uh, Native America a recognition of the wisdom in the seventh generation teaching uh, that teaching is that in any consideration or action uh, that you think about not only your own children or maybe children that you know if you don't have children of your own, but then the children that those children will have uh, and take that out seven generations. I found it's an interesting exercise to go back the other way and, of course, think about your parents one generation back and uh If you knew your grandparents, think about them. uh, And then try in your imagination, if you haven't done the genealogy, you can at least imagine uh, back seven generations. Well, who were those people? Of course, there are many of them when you get to that level. uh, What was going on in their lives? And how were they thinking about you? You know, because the world that we have today is a consequence uh, of their lives and their decisions just as seven generations from now, uh, the children who come into the world who are newly born uh, will have the consequences of the world that we leave them. That's a core teaching of this continent, and uh, I really think it needs to be embraced uh, at all levels, uh, personal, uh, community, and then on the federal level as well, how how different uh, our situation would be if we were considering uh, the seventh generations to come. Now, at the beginning of my book, Deep Agroecology, uh, I have a quote from the Udanushini, uh, who most people know as the Iroquois Six Nations of upstate New York. Uh, they have so many beautiful philosophical teachings and a great tradition of oratory. Uh, in a document that they uh, produced for the United Nations back in the 1970s, 
basic call to consciousness. Uh, they write that the way of life known as Western civilization is on a death path. Our central message to the world is a basic call to consciousness. Wake up. That's my word. <laughs> Wake up, because the destruction of native cultures and people, uh, which is still going on around the world, uh, and not just, you know, in, in South America, uh, but also in Canada, where they're trying to shove pipelines uh, across native land there, uh, that that same process of destroying the native cultures and people is the process which has destroyed and is destroying life on our planet. Uh, and, and here I think industrial agriculture, which creates so many problems for the environment uh, and for our health, uh, really needs to be held to account. We're always going to need uh, food produced on a very large scale. But it can be done cleanly. Uh, that's been established over and over. It's just that uh, the existing systems that are in place continue to produce profit uh, for those few people uh, who own the means of production. Uh, what agroecology and deep agroecology do is democratize the process much more widely, embrace the seventh generation teaching, uh, and recognize that uh, our actions to have consequences not just for our lives but for our children and our children's children. Yeah. You know, I think we need to all just recognize the connection that food has on everything from our health, our environment, our economy. I mean, you know, we just are so used to our, our way of life um, compartmentalizes everything and breaks everything apart, even just the body. You know, I remember when my husband broke his thumb and we went to a hand doctor and they're like, oh no, you have to go to a thumb doctor. I mean, even the hand wasn't <laughs> enough, you know, you had to go to a thumb specialist. I didn't um, know there was such a thing. Yeah, I mean, they really, you know, they just dissect the body into all separate little parts. They don't even look at the body as one whole unit anymore. And, you know, mm -hmm. We need to just realize that everything feeds off of everything else. And that's one of the reasons I love food so much because it really touches on our health and on our environment and all those things that are so important to me. And, um, you know, I think if we had universal health care, all of a sudden the government would pay attention to this connection and realize yes. that keeping us healthy would save them a lot of money because Excellent right now point. keeping us all sick creates a lot of money for all these different components. You know, the healthcare system makes a lot of money on us all being sick. Um, and, you know, the food producers of the junk food and the fast food, you know, they make a lot of money on us and, you know, if if the subsidies and healthy food was what we were promoting and people really were getting healthier, you know, that would take a lot of money away from hospitals and doctors and pharmaceutical companies and fast food companies. And, you know, that's part of capitalism. So it's a, you know, it's a catch-22, but we, I think we have to start by, you know, offering our health, health care to everybody and then, um, you know, other things will follow suit. You know, we just have to understand the connection that everything has together. Which One of the points I make in the book uh, is through using the word foundational and suggesting that uh, farms are the foundation of our civilization, just as the food they produce is the foundation of our health, the point you were just making. So right now, uh, of course, everything's shattering. Uh, everything's coming apart at the seams. Uh, but life's going to go on, and uh, new forms will emerge. And uh, right now, seeing your life, our lives, in that historical context, uh, it's so important to be directly and actively involved in building a new foundation uh, that is clean and healthy, whether it's organic, biodynamic, or some one of the other regenerative systems, uh, and then the distribution systems uh -huh. and on. Yeah, so, well, you know, in he, Wendell Berry's book, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's a rhetorical question in his book, you know, what are people for? And you raise a parallel question in your book, what are farms for? 
Um, mm-hmm. What are I you see them as our questions? main chance uh, for reckoning with everything that's going on in the world, uh, for uh, reordering things uh, so that the land is clean, the food is clean, and the people are healthier, stronger, uh, clearer thinking with their critical faculties, fully engaged uh, with what's going on. Uh, so, you know, all of the other wonderful technological inventions and developments that are going on in the world, that's great, uh, but you've got to have something solid to stand on uh, that will support you, uh, and that's the farms and the food that they produce. And I wanted to just mention uh, that I'm so appreciative of the work that you're doing, uh, and I think that your, your cooking class where you can make dinner for your family uh, in an hour uh, on Zoom with you is just so helpful uh, and models uh, uh, appropriate intelligent behavior uh, for people. So uh, keep on with that. And, of course, there are literally millions of other people uh, trying to do similar things, whether it's on farmland or in their kitchens. Uh, and uh, I encourage everyone to become involved uh, at some level. Uh, this is so important. Right now, uh, the healthy, clean, green uh, is a very small segment of the overall picture. But let's, coming out of this pandemic, uh, make it an enormous uh, and dominant and healthy part of everything. Yeah, well, I think you just hit on it because with this pandemic, because people are sequestered at home so much more. Cooking is really, you know, getting some new life, and I'm just so excited to see people cooking and, um, you know, using can, you know, even if you're using canned things, canned beans, um, frozen vegetables if you need to, if you can't get fresh. But just cooking, you know, for me, it's such a passion. It's, it's a way to um, transfer the love you feel inside to the people you care about. And so, you know, so when you talk about energetics, you know, when you were talking about biodynamics, I mean, you know, food carries that energy. And when you go out to eat, you don't know who's making your food. You don't know what kind of energy. They could have had a bad day, and the energy they're putting into that food is terrible. <laughs> but when, you, Definitely. when you're the one in the kitchen, not only can you put in the foods that you know your family loves and that you love, you can buy the best and, you know, put your love into it. So, anyway, And it's a creative act. Mm-hmm. It is. And, Stephen, we are just about out of time. So for those of you that are listening, you can find Stephen at, um, you can look up his book, Deep Agroecology, Farms, Food, and Our Future. Um, Stephen, do you want to share your website with everyone? Deep Agroecology, all written out as one word, dot net. You can also get there through dot org, but deepagroecology.net. Wonderful. And I'll share it on my website so you can find it there. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. And everyone out there, thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of the week. Join my Zoom class, and I'll see you all again next week. Bye for now.